Hi there, everyone. I am John Allen, and this is Last Week in the Church. Normally, I'd have three or four morsels of news for you, but over the past week, there are really only two stories that matter. The Vatican's McCarrick Report and the 2020 elections in America. I'm going to unpack both of them for you right now. All right, we begin with the Vatican's long-awaited report on the case of ex-cardinal and ex-priest Theodore McCarrick. Now, you will remember, two years ago in the summer of 2018, revelations of sexual misconduct and abuse surrounding McCarrick uh, created, fueled uh, a summer of crisis in the Catholic Church in America. We now call it the summer of shame because it came hard on the heels of the Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report. At that time, in September 2018, the Vatican promised a thorough investigation to get to the bottom of who knew what when in the Vatican. Uh, and promised to make the results of that investigation public. For two long years, we have been waiting and wondering, when are we going to get this report and is it going to deliver? Well, uh, this Tuesday, November 10th, we finally got it and boy, did it deliver. Now, I'm going to talk about what's in this report in a minute because it's incredibly important, but I first want to say something about the significance of the mere fact that it happened at all. What this report contains is an absolutely unprecedented lifting of the veil on what goes on inside the Vatican when the most sensitive decisions of all, of all are being made. I mean, we get the full text of a confidential letter from a cardinal telling the warning the Pope's ambassador that there are all sorts of charges floating around uh, against Theodore McCarrick uh, and warning against him getting any new job in the church. We know now, of course, that he got new jobs anyway. Uh, we get direct firsthand testimony. This report contains the results of 90 interviews with players in this story. So we get the direct testimony of people who came forward at various points, tried to blow the whistle on McCarrick, and for a variety of reasons, weren't listened to. Uh, we hear the direct testimony of victims of McCarrick it, it, in gut-wrenching detail, talking about what happened to them. I mean, disclosure on this scale and this level of sensitivity simply has never happened. And I would argue, folks, that this is as an important a moment in the history of the papacy as September 20th, 1870, when the armies of the new Italian Republic breached Porta Pia, one of the traditional entrances to the city here in Rome, marking the end of the papal states and therefore causing the popes to lose their tem temporal power. From that moment forward, they had to become an exclusively spiritual and moral power, which made the modern papacy possible. Well, you know what happened after 17, 1870? The papacy no longer had temporal power, but it armed itself with two new pieces of power. One was secrecy, the other was sovereignty. Secrecy meaning we don't tell you what's going on behind the curtain. Sovereignty meaning we don't owe you an explanation of anything. Well, what this report essentially represents is a monumental break with both of those sources of power that the Vatican has relied on for a century and a half. I, and think about the precedent value here, because any time from now until the end of time that there is a scandal, a crisis, a meltdown, a failure, if the Vatican doesn't come clean, at the level of detail in which it did in this report, the question is always going to be, why not and what are you trying to hide? Victims uh, who of other sex abuse scandals in which the Vatican played a part probably right now are demanding a similar accounting. Victims of financial scandals in the Vatican probably will demand a similar accounting. And frankly, it's going to be very difficult for the Vatican to explain why it won't do it. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, we have watched the pages of history turn this week. Remember, November 10th, 2020, the history of the Vatican and of the Catholic Church changed in a fundamental way. All right, content uh, of this report. In essence, what the report does is break down the way the McCarrick case was handled under three popes, St. John Paul II, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, and Pope Francis. Now, you may have read news headlines suggesting the report faults John Paul and Benedict and kind of gives Francis a free pass. For all I know, that may have been the idea, but it ain't so. 
Uh, Francis does not come out of this report unscathed either. Let's step through each briefly. Under John Paul II, the critical moment came in 2000. Remember, he appointed McCarrick Archbishop of Newark in 1986. At that stage, there wasn't a blot on his record. There was no negative information as far as the Vatican was concerned. But by 2000, when John Paul named McCarrick to the Archdiocese of Washington, uh, there was a good deal on the record, including uh, a sensational bombshell October 1999 letter from the late Cardinal John O'Connor of New York to the papal ambassador in Washington that made its way to John Paul, in which McCarrick details all sorts of charges against McCarrick. One, that he had made sexual advances on priests. Two, uh, that he was sleeping with young adult males, including seminarians, in his home on the Jersey Shore. Uh, and three, that there had been an anonymous accusation of pedophilia uh, against McCarrick. O'Connor concludes that given the risk of scandal, it would be a bad idea to send John Paul to Washington. Uh, now, what happened next uh, is that John Paul asked bishop, four bishops in New Jersey to look into these charges on his behalf. Uh, according to the report, those bishops supplied incomplete and inaccurate information. He also asked other bishops uh, who knew McCarrick. They gave him largely a clean bill of health, uh, or at least raised doubts uh, about the credibility of these accusations. And on that basis, with a few other considerations thrown in, uh, McCarrick got Washington. The next year, he got the red hat as a cardinal and remained at the pinnacle of power uh, in the Catholic Church for some time to come. Uh, under Pope Benedict, we know that in 2006, uh, there were oral instructions from the Vatican given to McCarrick asking him to keep a low, profi low profile, to stay out of the spotlight. That's because some of these charges had resurfaced with new details. And in 2008, those instructions, kind of an appeal really to his conscience, uh, th those instructions were put into writing, uh, but McCarrick essentially ignored them. Uh, and there was absolutely no effort made to enforce them. This report also tells us the Pope Benedict was advised at one stage to open a canonical investigation, that is, an investigation under church law against McCarrick. He declined uh, on the basis that at that stage, the charges didn't involve abuse of minors, it was misconduct with adults. Uh, also, given McCarrick's age, the fact that he retired uh, from Washington in 2006, Benedict decided that a canonical investigation just wasn't worth it. Uh, and so what that allowed, of course, is for the next 12 years, McCarrick was still able to hold himself out as a cardinal in good standing. Uh, his star actually rose uh, in the early days of the Francis papacy. He was able to conduct these informal diplomatic troubleshooting missions and, and keep himself at the heart of the action in a variety of different ways. Now we come to Pope Francis. There were, of course, uh, those explosive charges from the Pope's former ambassador in Washington, Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano, that he had personally briefed Francis about McCarrick in June 2013, uh, but that uh, Pope Francis did nothing, uh, and Vigano actually suggested the Pope should resign uh, over that failure. Now the report essentially rejects all of that. Uh, it says that there is no evidence to support Vigano's account of events, that what transpired in that conversation between him and the Pope is, quote, sharply disputed. Uh, and it concludes that all Pope Francis knew uh, in 2013 was that there were old rumors, old charges about McCarrick, but he trusted that they had been looked into and dismissed under John Paul II and Benedict XVI, and so he didn't see anything, any need to do anything more himself. Now, you know, that, that may be uh, an attempt to insulate Francis from blame, but let us think about what the report says. What it says is that as early as 2013, when Francis was elected, he knew that there had been charges of sexual misconduct against one of his cardinals. And instead of launching his own investigation, collecting information for himself, what he did was he trusted what previous popes had done. I don't think that's a free pass. Uh, I think it says there is a measure of responsibility pre-2018 in this papacy as well, because remember, Francis didn't kick into gear with McCarrick until these revelations became public. All right, that's the content uh, of the report. Now. Let's talk about what the big takeaway from this report is. 
A lot of people went into reading the McCarrick Report anxious to find bad guys and smoking guns. That is, who were the rotten apples here who were responsible for dropping the ball on McCarrick? And where is the proof, the, the hard proof, uh, incontrovertibly, that shows what they did? Well, look, I mean, to some extent, the report does deliver on that. You can identify some bad guys and you can, del you can identify some smoking guns. But you know who the real bad guy in this report is? The real villain of this story, aside from McCarrick himself? It's clericalist culture. What this report proves is that over and over and over again, when there were warnings, there were charges, there were indications, what the Vatican did is they talked to other bishops. They listened exclusively to other bishops. I'll give you two moments. In that October 1999 uh, letter from Cardinal O'Connor, he recommended that the Vatican ambassador in the States speak to a lawyer by the name of Tom Durkin and an American priest in New York by the name of James Cassidy, both of whom uh, were well informed on the case. Never happened. It never happened. What the Vatican ambassador and other Vatican officials did instead was solicit the opinions of other bishops. And on the basis of that, they chose to drop it. Uh, earlier than that, in 1994, when there was talk that John Paul II might visit Newark, which he eventually did a year later, uh, a religious superior, a nun in the States, Mother Mary Quentin Sheridan, a member of the Sisters of Mercy of Alma, Michigan, who knew uh, someone who claimed to have been uh, approached in an inappropriate way by McCarrick, wrote to the papal ambassador to, to make that report. Uh, and uh, the papal ambassador read the letter. She had recommended that he talk to a priest. He did. Uh, both of them told him, this is serious, this is real. What did he do? He asked other bishops for their opinion. And once again, on the basis of that, dropped it. All right, now the takeaway here is that the problem here is not that you've got corrupt people doing shady things. What this report shows is basically decent, well-meaning people who are operating with huge blinders imposed by the bias that says, when decisions like this have to be made, it is only the input, the experience, the perspective of bishops that matters. That's what's got to change. And it is slowly changing. We, we saw, for instance, the way Pope Francis eventually handled the sex abuse crisis in Chile. He did not take the bishop's word for it. He sent his own investigators. This report is an indication that that culture is changing. Uh, but the work is not done yet. You want a takeaway? That's it. This report is not an indictment of a pope. It's not an indictment of any particular cabal of Vatican officials. It's an indictment of a culture. All right, let's shift gears to the 2020 elections in America because early November 2020 didn't just bring us the McCarrick report, it also brought us this earthquake uh, of an election in the United States. Uh, I'm not going to rehash the gory details of it all. You were probably as intimately familiar with them as I am for spending far too many hours glued to the TV, waiting for the latest batch of votes to drop someplace that would tell us who won this election. Now, of course, basically speaking, we know, uh, assuming that the, the result withstands the various legal challenges that President Trump is, is making. Uh, but three notes about the, the Catholic context of all of this. First of all, uh, you know, uh, pundits and pollsters and analysts are going to tell you that it was the African-American vote, it was the blue-collar vote. They'll, they'll give you various constituencies that made the difference in this election. But you can make just as good an argument that the constituency that actually won this election for Joe Biden were white Catholics. Uh, I mean, look at it. Uh, exit polls are kind of all over the map, uh, but uh, best numbers we have from the AP vote cast are that Trump uh, won the white Catholic vote by a razor thin margin, 50 to 49. Now, if that's true, uh, it's about a six to eight percent drop from 2016. And where are these white Catholics disproportionately concentrated in America? They're in Michigan, they're in Wisconsin, they're in Pennsylvania, those three Rust Belt states 
that made the difference between 2016 and 2020. Now, the president-elect, of course, has thanked all sorts of constituencies, in a particular way, the African-American constituency, which, of course, saved his campaign during primary season and, and did uh, vote for him in strong numbers in, in the general election. But if he wants to thank somebody, Really, he ought to be thanking his fellow white Catholics in America because, arguably, they are the ones who put him into the White House. Now, secondly, uh, the, the president-elect, uh, despite the fact that the U.S. State Department reportedly is not turning over messages from foreign leaders, nevertheless has been making a round of phone calls to, to leaders around the world who wanted to congratulate him and try to get their relationship with the new administration off on a good foot. One of those world leaders we now know is Pope Francis. Uh, on Thursday, uh, President-elect Joe Biden and Pope Francis had a phone call. Uh, and what we know about it, it comes largely from the Biden camp. Uh, the campaign released a read-through, which is journo speak for a summary of the conversation, basically saying that the Pope offered his congratulations and best wishes. Uh, and that the two men talked about various issues of common interest, including immigration, climate change, COVID, uh, and the economy. Now, you know, this has driven some people in the Catholic Twitter sphere nuts because the question is, well, you know, why wasn't the Pope also talking about abortion, the contraception mandate as part of health care reform, and so on? Now, look, here's the thing. Uh, we do not have a read through from the Vatican. We only have it from the Biden side. And obviously they are going to emphasize areas where they think the two men are going to agree, not where they're gonna clash. So let's not go nuts. Uh, all we've had from the Vatican is a confirmation that the phone call took place. But I would nevertheless suggest that this phone call may be a down payment on a very intriguing historical possibility that we're going to watch unfold over the next four years, which is this. Think about what happened in 1980. The United States elected a new president who represented a sharp break from the four years that had gone before. Those four years were, of course, the Carter years. America ins instead elected Ronald Reagan. Uh, and uh, as it happened, there was a reforming pope in office at the time that happened. Uh, it was Pope, now Saint, John Paul II. And at that time, the world faced a defining crisis. That crisis was the Cold War, the prospect of nuclear annihilation, and the contest between democracy and communism. That president and that pope found each other. They pooled forces and they engaged in a historic struggle that I think virtually every historian would tell you collectively set the dominoes in motion that led to the collapse of the Soviet Empire. Now, once again, the United States has elected a president that represents a dramatic break with what went before, and we have a reforming pope in office, and the world faces another defining crisis. And that, of course, is the COVID-19 pandemic with all of its economic, social, political, and cultural ramifications. Now, will this pope and this president find one another Will they, like Reagan and John Paul before, will they be able to unite the world's greatest hard power and the world's greatest soft power in a common struggle to change history? Well, I mean, we don't know, but that is the drama of the next four years, isn't it? You have a pope and a president who in many ways sing from the same songbook. Francis, of course, is the chaplain of the global drive to care for the environment uh, and to fight climate change, to fight global warming. Uh, he is a supporter of immigrant rights. He is an opponent of death penalty, of the death penalty. Uh, he is a reconciler in conflict zones. Uh, he is an advocate of racial justice. Uh, he is an advocate of dialogue at all levels. Somebody who wants to, uh, who is an advocate of civility as opposed to um, harsh rhetoric and uh, antagonism. Uh, and in all of those ways, he and Biden are cut from the same cloth. Will there be flashpoints over the next four years? You bet, and they'll probably start on day one. Uh, candidate Biden promised that on his first day in office, among other things, 
He would repeal the Mexico City policy that prevents the use of taxpayer dollars to fund abortions overseas. Uh, that's something every incoming Democratic president has repealed, every incoming Republican president has put back in force. That means from the very first day of his administration, Joe Biden is probably going to do something the Vatican is not going to like. Uh, that said, the prospects for partnership are far more profound than the flashpoints that we can anticipate. I think the drama of the next four years is whether we will see, in some sense, a replay of the drama of that partnership between St. John Paul and Ronald Reagan, only with two very different men pursuing a very different agenda. All right, that is last week today. Uh, please keep reading the Crux site, that is cruxnow.com, cruxnow.com, your one-stop shopping destination for the very best in smart, wired, and independent Catholic journalism. We will see you again next week. In the meantime, I'm John Allen. Stay healthy, stay safe, have a fantastic and blessed week.